or many articles that you read, they start off with these apologies and these disclaimers. Endometriosis is a very confusing, enigmatic disease caused by one of 10 or 12 or 13 different possible theories. Uh, it's confusing to physicians. It's confusing to patients. And, you know, I got to worrying about this some years ago uh, because it didn't seem like the thought was very crisp. And I thought to myself, well, the only reason that there is confusion on a topic, whether it's catching fish or endometriosis or building houses, is because some of the founding principles that we operate with must be wrong. They simply have to be wrong. And so the, uh, the, the, the purpose uh, you know, for my study was to try to find out what was it that was wrong. Uh, what seemed like kind of a big undertaking to me at the start, taking on many generations of gynecology, but I wanted to review with you uh, the results of uh, my study. The study basically consisted of uh, my first 143 consecutive patients with endometriosis. Uh, most of them, the vast majority, had histologic confirmation of their disease. Uh, six were diagnosed just by the visual uh, manifestation of the so-called classic black implant. The symptoms of endometriosis, you see here, pelvic pain is the most common symptom in this series of untreated patients. Dysmenorrhea, 45%. Dyspareunia, 37%. Only about a quarter of them complained of infertility, which uh, immediately kind of went against the grain of what you read in the literature, where infertility <coughs> is, my God, it's, it's considered the be-all and end-all of the disease. This is how patients are selected. This is how successful treatment uh, is measured, is by infertility. And yet, out in rural Oregon, uh, just no referral patients at that point, most of the patients had pelvic pain, not infertility. Uh, pain with various kinds of exercise and such, and 20% were asymptomatic. The pelvic pain that women with endometriosis come in describing is frequently characteristic. They use these words. They say it's a sharp, stinging, burning, or knife-like kind of pain. It's very frequently non-menstrual, despite what you read in the textbook about being associated with the menstrual flow. And very commonly, the patients will uh, twist their fist either towards you or towards themselves in kind of a twisting motion as if they're stabbing themselves when they uh, describe this pain. The age distribution of these patients you see here is fairly typical, uh, anywhere from 16 to 52. Uh, mean age of diagnosis, just under 30. Now this type of a chart does not mean that uh, endometriosis, you know, occurs here or, you know, most, mostly occurs here or here. This is just when these people come to diagnosis. Their disease obviously has been present for some time previously. In terms of fertility, in this untreated group of patients, 66% of them had conceived and 54% were Paris, which allows me to make the statement that endometriosis is a disease of fertile women not of infertile women. And uh, it struck me as peculiar that, my gosh, you know, these people apparently get pregnant without difficulty. Most of them uh, have had children. And it kind of worried me that, uh, you know, about the fertility aspect being used so commonly in the literature for purposes of study and patient selection. If we're dealing with a disease that doesn't really have an absolute effect on fertility, uh, can we really uh, look at the literature with a less than a jaundice eye now? Diagnosis, I make it on a typically with a history, the typical history of pain, the single most important finding on my exam uh, is exquisite tenderness of the cul-de-sac or unicycle ligaments to very light stroking with your finger, with your middle finger, with resultant facial grimace on the part of the patient. You can diagnose endometriosis with one hand behind your back. I agree with Gordon, you don't need to do a rectovaginal exam. All you have to do is just very gently, and don't push, you know, just very gently, just stroke the, uh, the rear, uh, the posterior fornix, the cul-de-sac, uterus, the ligaments, if that, and watch the patient's face. If she's kind of sitting there going like this or arching her back and some of these people will you know, be brought to tears, uh, the chance of her having endometriosis is quite high. And of course you follow up with laparoscopy or laparotomy, whatever the case may uh, be. But I figured, well, gee whiz, if I'm going to be discovering basic principles that have gone undetected about this disease, uh, what can be more basic than where is it in the pelvis and what color is it? Now, in terms of finding the disease for this study, and also finding the disease just for your clinical management of patients, magnification of the peritoneum, 
is mandatory, particularly when you're starting out. At laparoscopy, you need to use what's called near-contact laparoscopy, which is what you saw uh, in, the, in the room there. The laparoscope just advances up to within a centimeter or two of the you know, peritoneal surface. You get a good magnified view. Uh, at laparotomy, it, it may be helpful while, you, while you're learning this uh, you know, identification to use an operating microscope in the, uh, uh, in the early stages of your training so that you can kind of be tuned in to what you're looking for. You don't always need to have uh, you know, magnification at laparoscopy, I mean, at laparotomy, but uh, it may help. Mm -hmm. This is the pelvic map that I use to uh, chart where the disease was in all these 143 patients. I simply, uh, on every patient, I would prospectively uh, chart, uh, where chart where biopsy proven endometriosis, endometriosis was. was. I didn't include, I didn't include anything, anything that, you know, was, you know, was possible, possible endometriosis. Uh, it, uh, had it had glands and stroma. And, and the numbers here basically represent the order, the order, of, order of frequency distribution, distribution of, of the disease. Of the disease. The cul-de-sac was the most commonly involved. Right uterocircle, broad leg, left uterocircle, left ear, broad leg, etc. Notice on here that the ovaries are still in the list. And you can find any one of a number of articles of articles 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 and I was seeking to try to find out and I seek to try to find out natural some characteristic of the disease natural in terms of is it a disease in terms of is it a disease that will recur and if you surgically remove it will it recur because these two points follow from the same theory administration of an implantation of this has paralyzed the this has paralyzed the illness this has paralyzed the illness and I said we'll see what I said we'll see what people think it's progressive so they don't want to operate 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 well, there's only two ways I can think of to validate whether or not endometriosis is a progressively spread disease to do serial laparoscopy in an untreated group of charting the involvement in the pelvis on the map. The second is to identify an increased frequency of more extended group patients. That's a lot of words, but it's a very simple concept that you'll see. Here is another human condition that is progress spreading. Uh, it's fatal rate. You'll notice on the left, my, I have abrupt My, my father-in-law looks like he's 110 years old. And this is what happens when something is progressively spreading in the body, in, in target area. More and more of the target area is involved, and uh, you know, deeper froze or uh, you know, more severe disease in a sense. It happens at the face of coronary artery disease, and I'm sorry, it must happen with endometriosis too if it is a progressively spreading disease. So, if you, uh, the, the most common areas of the pelvis that are involved with endometriosis, frequency of occurrence versus lines that go up like this. But when you sit down, when you sit down and, uh, you know, and map it all out, you find that nothing of, this, of the kind happens. Uh, there may actually even be an increase in frequency of disease and for age groups. You see here age groups, uh, I divide five variables, uh, versus have all these six most common areas. But nowhere do, uh, do the lines go up. So I said, hmm, this is very interesting. I, I don't know whether I call it a regressive disease, but certainly I find no evidence that it's a regressive disease. I didn't open that chart because they're not commonly involved in this. The static nature of endometriosis on the ovaries was first noted by none other than John Sampson back in 1927 when he, when he made the observation that it nearly always occurs on the lateral and under surface of that organ. He didn't realize it then, but he was uh, on the static nature of the disease then, and the ecology has gone in the opposite direction. Years. And uh, this is just, you know, some simple statistics. This uh, just shows in statistical form the number of pelvic areas involved in the younger age versus the number of pelvic areas involved in the older age groups, and older age groups don't have more disease. I tried to look for evidence of progress behind it. There's only two reasons possible for it. It either doesn't exist or I didn't look for it in the right way. And, but since I can't think of any other way to look for it, you know, maybe maybe it just doesn't exist. <coughs> what is uh, pregnancy? You know, we've heard about people, uh, you know, being protected against uh, this disease by pregnancy. How true? Uh, well, we heard people had 3.15 pelvic areas involved. The ever-pregnant people, had 2.32 areas involved. Well, it was. the literature, you know, was right. Uh, it seems as if from this chart that pregnancy does protect the disease. But look down here, the mean age. The age of the never people was 26.3. The mean age of uh, ever pregnant people, five years older. We just found out from the preceding uh, graph that older patients have, in this for some, apparently less disease. So with that kind of age factor in there, you have to control for age. When you control extent of disease versus parity, 
you'll find that in groups in Tuamotu, no statistically significant uh, difference in terms of uh, number of because of people who have never been pregnant versus actually delivering one, three children. So I looked for evidence of paternity. Uh, in centers, I found that role. <coughs> Therefore, I can make a statement that the extent of pelvic involvement by endometriosis does not increase with age. Further, the progression of symptoms not mean spread of disease. This is one of the traps we've fallen into over the years. People hurt worse, they must be getting more disease. Well, that doesn't necessarily follow, but uh, in times with other things that it then tends up as a given. Remission, contrarily, remission of symptoms does not necessarily mean the disease is gone. Just because their symptoms go away doesn't mean that the phenazole is curing them or that the pregnancy has cured them. And again, another trap that we've fallen into. And finally, pregnancy provides no significant protection against diagnosis. Well, if it's a sick disease, and if in fact, you know, you r do remove it all at surgery, why, you know, th then risk conservative surgery should be quite low. And in fact, when you examine the literature, you find that the highest article that has no obvious arithmetic in it shows that the recurrence rate is only 27 percent. Articles, much, you know, much lower than that. In my own hands, uh, it's less than 5 percent. Now, I can't say that I go back and relaparoscope all my patients. I do relaparoscope some, and in most of them, I do not find any endometriosis. And the ones, the very, I found it in four people out of about 200. It's been small amounts, and I, I, probably I just missed it. Um, okay, you'd say, gee whiz, uh, the uh, ACOG technical bulletin on endometriosis quotes a 40 percent uh, recurrence rate after conservative surgery, and um, I, here's a handout that speaks to that. This is, uh, that was from Russell Malinak's uh, work. And he gave me a manuscript. Uh, he probably should have done it, because uh, I don't know where it came from, and won't go into it, but basically the 40% that you see quoted is arithmetic error, and there's a, a reason for it that's on that uh, handout. Okay, well, well, you know, many people, you would still think it's a progressively spreading disease. I, uh, I stand one year, I see a I looked in another year, I saw lots, or some. And the answer to that, of course, is what I call atypical implants. Uh, these are just, if, if the classic black powder burn implant is a typical lesion, then atypical ones are just non-powder burn. The Australian called them not taking the color what we saw from there, you know. Now here's some of the color uh, descriptive terms that I used in this study, just to kind of, again, get a handle on it, just, uh, is just my subjective impression at at the first time I look in at lap laparotomy or the first time I look through the laparoscope, does that woman have in that area, what color is that disease? I mean, white, clear, red, yellow, what have you. And here's some uh, examples of some of these. Clear papules can be very difficult to see. They're kind of over here. Some of this red uh, is probably from uh, probing at the cul-de-sac to take this picture. But if you turn them up, these little papules will start to show up. You catch the light. Now notice, uh, some of these clear papules don't have any hemorrhage around them. Here's one that's got adjacent hemorrhage. And microscopically, when you look at these things, here's glandular epithelium with some stroma. This doesn't have much of that fibromuscular stuff that Dr. Davis was talking about. And not all uh, examples histologically will have the fibromuscular stuff. But notice this. Uh, in many of these slides that you'll be seeing, here's the glands and stroma. Let me see if I've got a closer view. Well, I guess I don't. Let's go back. In, in many of the glands and stroma, they're, they're, they're really not very many capillaries. Here's some blood vessels over here, and here's some blood vessels over here, and kind of scattered around. But the glands and stroma themselves frequently are, are devoid of capillaries or have very few capillaries. And when you think about it, if you, were, if you were just a medical student and you were given this slide in your first year uh, by your professor, and uh, looked at it and say, he told you, what color do you think that would be in the body? Uh, and you look at it and say, well, hmm, with your knowledge of medicine, you say, well, our skin is pink because it has blood vessels. Our hernia and lens are clear because they don't have blood vessels. Uh, a leg that has a blood clot, you know, and ischemia is white because there's no blood. Uh, so I guess if something is devoid of blood, it might be clear. And the point is, is that the existence of clear papules could have been predicted you know, 60 years ago, just from histologic characteristics of the mucus under the microscope, but it wasn't. Okay, uh, here's a clear papule right there, and you'll, you know, you, 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 as as time goes by, you can start to see some adjacent hemorrhage. The red that occurs is basically just blood, however, but it does attract your eye. You can tell exactly, you know, on this type of a slide, or at laparoscopy or laparotomy necessarily, it was not endometriosis, and so you have to be suspicious of this entire area. Microscopically, 
glands and stroma. This may be some of that fibromyalgia that Gordon was talking about. Again, though, look, as you look through there, you don't really see eye capillaries in here. Here's one over here and over here and some off there. Typical implant may well be devoid of capillaries, and therefore I'm able to make the statement that endometriosis frequently does not bleed because it can't. It may incite bleeding from adjacent capillaries, but the glandular epithelium does not secrete blood as an intraluminal product. It secretes some clear mucinous stuff. And uh, since the stroma and fibromuscular stuff may be frequently void of capillary, uh, it itself can't bleed. It, it may on occasion, but not always. So endometriosis, just, you know, it, it may not bleed. And that's why we see other types of lesions. This is a 24-year-old nurse on the hospital floor at the hospital. She had a laparoscopy uh, for pelvic pain that was uh, negative. And uh, she started and she went along for about a year, year and a half. Finally came to see me, and I said, "Well, look, unless I did, I can't trust anybody else except perhaps Mother Davis." And uh, so I've got a laparoscopy, even though it was ago. And lo and behold, it's her left ureter ligamentia. That's her left too. And this called back. Her left ureter ligamentia and cul-de-sac were literally riddled with endometriosis. And this uh, looks pretty much like what I think we were looking at today. That kind of a whitish uh, fibrosis that uh, begins to surround stuff. Again, glands and stroma. Uh, really not much in terms of you know, blood levels in the glands and stroma itself. This reject from the University of Oregon Medical School, she had gone to the Mecca. Uh, she was told, you have endometriosis, go ye and get pregnant, even though we now know that pregnancy provides no protective effect or apparently no significant treatment for the disease. Uh, thick, you know, fibrosis and whitest scarring. You can't tell where endometriosis is in here. Here was one so-called typical black powder burn implant, if you will. That was the only one she had. The rest of the stuff was just all kind of whitish and uh, scarred up. Again, under the microscope glands and stroma. Now notice uh, at, at these, I don't know, it, it's very instructive to look at your microscope slides. Uh, you can see varying degrees of differentiation here among the glands. Some, such as these, uh, have thicker epithelium, seem to be a little bit better differentiated than, than these that have thinner epithelium and over there that have thinner epithelium. The differentiation may even extend to the uh, uh, amount and character of the strome, that fibromus fibromuscular stuff that uh, Dr. Davis was talking about. So in other words, these are really heterogeneous uh, uh, lesions under the microscope. And uh, is that how I pronounce that word? They're, they look different under the microscope and certainly look different in pelvis as well. Red implants are very difficult to see uh, because they can blend well with very red structures such as there's the fimbria of the left tube and over and I almost missed that but I was pretty happy to pick that up. Glandular epithelium with stroma. Again, notice, you know, I, I really blood vessels. Uh, there may be some somewhere, maybe all the blood drained out, but I am struck by how infrequent blood vessels are. Another University of Oregon reject. This is uh, this had kind of a yellowish cast. Uh, the, as as you were picking up the yellowish, uh, the whitish. Basically, this relates to adjacent fibrosis that is affected by the irritation disease. And here you can the, the glands are kind of compressed. This was a, here's a sucker for uh, dimension purposes. This is a little whitish area. Uh, some people, when they see these whitish lesions, they say, oh, this is burned out disease, son. Let's go over it. This woman can't be hurting because uh, this disease is burned out. Well, burned out disease is an anthropomorphic term that the endometriosis does not understand. It is a very stupid disease. It does not speak English. It just does what it does. That's going to cause pain. But, you know, imagine, look at all this blood streaming off the edge of this pack. You can kind of s almost sense that the capillaries around it destabilized. And um, imagine something like that under your eyelid. Uh, how do you think you could tolerate that? You don't have to have much disease to bring these women to their knees in terms of pain. Again, glands and stroma. Notice uh, this gland glandular epithelium. Well, it might be a little bit less differentiated than that. It's, it's tough to say at this power. Yellow papules are very difficult to see unless you get right down there and know what you're looking for. Glands and stroma. Occasionally, and this is good, you'll like this. You'll even see what is called the typical black burning plant of endometriosis. This is what is reproduced uh, time and again in the literature. This is what people apparently are using to make their diagnosis of the disease most commonly. But actually, as you'll see from the numbers that follow, this is an uncommon manifestation of the disease. Well, I think you get the picture. Any abnormality of the pelvic peritoneum is endometriosis until proven otherwise by biopsy. If you don't biopsy it, your, your work is a matter of opinion. Not a, not a fact out of science. Well, when you sit down and, you know, kind of total up the numbers, of um, these 40 patients, well, yeah, most of them, 57% had black implants, but look at this. 
more had atypical implants. And 30 percent had black implants only, but more had atypical implants only. What slide means is if the surgeon is bullheadedly looking only for black lesions, he is going to miss half of all disease and completely, you know, diagnose almost half of all patients. So uh, the concept of the black out of an implant is a very incomplete picture of the disease, and yet I think you're getting the idea that the literature has been looking solely at year after year after year. Imagine the amount of selection bias that has gone on. Are we really getting the straight scoop when we read the literature? Okay, well, you take the, the type of the lesions, clear papules only, clear papules with other types, red only, etc., and mark them out here, and then look at mean age, you see something very interesting that happens with uh, endometriosis. The, uh, as the patients get older, the lesions change in appearance until finally the black implant predominates uh, in the early 30s. And when you go back and look at the older literature, you find that uh, all these people from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, the average age in those patient populations is like mid 30s. And that's when the black powder and implant pre predominates. And that's what's been handed down over and over again to us. And we're, we're dead water. We're water. We've only been seeing the tip of the iceberg. OK, what about treatment? Well, uh, I don't use medicine of any type in my patients. Why? Because they won't let me. And why won't they let me? Because when you give them informed consent, as required by Oregon based law, you have to tell them this. Regarding Danazolbogy, the same thing largely about uh, GRH or birth control pills. Danazol has been proven not to eradicate endometriosis. We all know it's expensive. Androgenic side effects. Virtually 100% of patients have some side effect. High rate of pain recurrence because it doesn't eliminate the disease. In terms of fertility, surgery has been shown to be better for higher stages, which means more pelvic adhesions. And observation is better or equivalent for lower stages. And another study just in fertility and sterility in January confirmed that. Uh, it lowers HDL cholesterol. So these people, if they took it for some of them, have, I've ha found some patients have been on it for two or three years, hoping against hope that their disease will be uh, you know, Are they in for heart attack? Does it osteoporosis? Well, it might if you take it or GNRH for year after year. So my patients won't let me use it. OK, now. Here is an electron microscope picture of an endometriosis cell from the ovary that's been eating high-dose danazol in those months. There, you know, the, the gland is alive and well, thank you. No obvious addition or observed. I mean, this is a patient treated with Depo-Provera. Uh, note that the glands remain active. Don't do, don't do what I done to a woman from Fairbanks, Alaska, two weeks ago. Uh, she came in, she had six, she had had uh, her left ovary, part of her ovary removed, uh, she'd had uh, you know, some pulgaration attempts, she'd had a uh, pre neurectomy, she'd had, uh, you know, just the parting her out. By the time she got to me, she had no ovaries. Her uterus woman from Fairbanks, Alaska, two weeks ago, uh, she came in. She had had six ovaries. She had had uh, her left ovary, had her ovary removed. Uh, she'd had, uh, you know, some fulguration attempts. She'd had a uh, pre neurectomy. She'd had, uh, you know, just the parting her out. By the time she got to me, she had no ovaries. Her uterus, nobody had even tried to attack the endometriosis. Plus, she was on Depo-Provera. She'd been taking 150 milligrams of Depo-Provera in the last six months. She was, she was wondering why she was still hurting. Her doctor was wondering why is this woman still hurting. He had done literally everything medically possible in terms of hormonal deprivation to treat the disease, and she was still hurting. But she, they hadn't treated the disease surgically. Hey, but don't take my word for it. Just because they dance and other things don't work, and just because you've seen it with your own eyes, don't take that. Let's go to the guys who develop birth control pill therapy and uh, Danazol. I have never been impressed by the curative effect of any medical. You can read. There's no drug. Sad state of affairs. Well, why is this? Well, let's go back to the original uh, Domowski article from uh, April or May, March of 1975 in the Green Journal. This represents an after picture of total cure of endometriosis. This is, this is it. Notice, you, he's using panoramic laparoscopy. You see everything. You know, he's still hemocytorin deposits on the peritoneal surface, you know. He did not see that. He only biopsied what looked like obvious from uh, April or May, March of 1975 in the Green Journal. This represents an after picture of total cure of endometriosis. This is, this is it. Notice, you, he's using panoramic laparoscopy. You see everything. You know, he says, oh, hemocytorin deposits on the peritoneal surface, you know. He did not biopsy this. He only biopsied what looked like obvious endometriosis. In those biopsies, it came back positive. That was 15% of his patients had obvious disease still. He didn't biopsy stuff like this, you know. And uh, 
because of what you now know, endometriosis can be very tiny, very subtle in the pelvis, uh, such as that. And this is a m more magnified view than the uh, you know, other one. As siderosis goes, buried in there are little clear papules of disease. And so when you look at that again under greater magnification, you know, uh, the details of what he said was not endometriosis, as well as his thought processes begin to work. It's another total cure of endometriosis. What's this stuff down here? Never know. They didn't biopsy it. This was sold to the American public as to cure disease. What's the stuff on the other? You know, we, we don't know. They didn't biopsy it. There were no biopsy controls of those early studies. And you wouldn't expect, you know, that uh, you would expect that there should be a reason that stuff doesn't respond to medicine. Medicine is probably the been found to have uh, a very kind of low carrying population of estrogen receptors. And for something to respond well to the presence or absence of hormones, it endometriosis doesn't fill the bill. It is not the same as the medium endometriosis. The persistence of disease that was made before, it probably is in most cases. Okay, in terms of conservative surgery that I do, uh, it's almost exactly what Gordon does uh, with a laser. I do it uh, with, you know, cutting and, and such, and you'll see a videotape later today of my technique. I can do it at about 75%. Uh, go, this number was about 45%, so I'm getting better all the time, and, you know, with experience, my learning curve is still going up. It's an outpatient procedure for most, you know, other obvious advantages. And uh, the ideal candidate uh, for microscopic excision is under 35. The reason is when they're under 35, they don't have a lot of other gynecological problems necessarily. They don't have thyroidal smears perhaps. You know, uh, they're just less likely to have other problems. And so simply petriosis will help them out greatly. Um, plus, if they're under 35, there may not be as fibrosis of the pectoral uh, and such. Hopefully, previous physical therapy will be coming up. Uh, if somebody there and kind of routed around and left a much scar tissue, hopefully they're not massively obese. And hopefully an involvement because the uh, cutting technique I use is, is and probably less than the laser is on the ovary. Now these are just relative angle me because you like this patient's coming in, coming in with those factors. And here's how I do it. You'll see this later. Here's uh, some clear papules here in the back. Notice the hemorrhage. Uh, if, if this area that was red biopsy, it would probably just come back hemorrhage. This area back endometrial. Okay. Here's the Caspers. Now somebody asked what kind of device I use regular. And uh, you grasp the entire area to be removed, you tint it up, just as he did. You use your scissors to circumscribe around the entire area with a, a nice wide margin, just Gordon did with a laser. And uh, you make a nick, that's, that's the nick in the end that I'm getting started. And as I said, once the entire lesion is circumscribed, you start pushing with the scissors and kind of pushing and spreading motion. You can, you can see pushing and spreading, that's uh, very similar to what he was doing with the laser beam. And you can see under the lesion, you can avoid uh, damage. And once you're through, uh, you know, that's what, uh, uh, relatively not, uh, you can go on to the next one. And that's what's her disease under the microscope. Now, here lady, in, the, in her pelvis, she had one black powder burn lesion right here. And yet, look at all these blood holes uh, nearby that are just destabilized and bleeding. This one here was negative for endometriosis. This was positive. So you can have abnormal vasculature. You can have bleeding blood vessels without actually having adjacent endometriosis. Uh, as if this stuff secretes something that destabilizes uh, the vessels in that area, which brings up an, a very important question, and that is, okay, we know we have endometriosis, but is some problem with peritoneum itself? Is there a problem uh, going along with this? Because, you know, if this stuff is being, is secreting something that's irritating this area, washing it up, and uh, you see this kind of an effect all over the pelvis or all over the pelvis. Okay, what about the uh, AFS classification system for endometriosis we have to use to gain good insight into this disease? Well, this is the, uh, the older version of the AFS system. Uh, it, got, it went up to 55 points. You see here, most of my patients, 55 percent scored, you know, less than six points. The ones who scored over uh, six points, of course, as higher and higher on the scale, you have to have more scar tissue to get uh, that many points. But half of these people up here have some other reason for their scar tissue, such as previous surgery or previous pelvic infection. But the point here is that with, with this type of classification system, it seems to lack discriminatory capacity. And how does it help me to know, you know, 85% of my patients have what I think is mild disease because they don't have a lot of scar tissue. Uh, how does that help me? I don't know. Okay, let's go on and look at, uh, the, again, the AFS point system. And now I've plotted out the number of pelvic areas involved in my patients down here across the bottom. And look at this. You can have 6, 8, 10, 12 areas of the pelvis involved, and as long as you have ovarian involvement or tubal involvement or scar tissue, they, they wouldn't score a lot of uh, points. Five areas, you know, look. So 
the, uh, the clinical correlation of the AFS score with true standard of the pelvis is poor. And why is that? Well, it's not that classification system that was in vogue then. It scored a lot of points for things that aren't endometriosis, and it weighted a lot of points towards the tubes and ovaries. And uh, the new system that is out for the last year or whatever is worse because although they eliminated the fallopian tube because they realized that it was not very commonly involved, they have still retained the ovary, which is actually not very commonly involved with endometriosis, but yet they score a lot of points for the ovary. Now, the reason the ovary is on this list is not, it, it, I, I, I found out, you know, why the ovary is on this system. It's included not because it was commonly involved. It was included because they were afraid that the ovary was involved and if you did something that would cause scar tissue in the future that would reduce the woman's fertility and therefore that's why the ovary was important. So in other words, what they're trying to score when they look at the ovary is they're trying to score for future scar tissue that they don't know whether or not it's going to occur. You know, how ridiculous can you get? And then down here, everything from down the source they guard to you. And when you add up this last column, just for an example, you find out that 67% of the points on the system score for scar tissue, not for endometriosis. You know, I can take a joke. Uh, but uh, maybe, you know, maybe a staging system is premature because people write it. Well-defined diseases. In symbiosis, its cause is thought to be unknown by most people. The visual manifestations begin and not standardized, probably frequently overlooked. And even the microscopic definition varies. Glands and stroma, <coughs> glands, fibrosis, and cirrhosis. These are all textbook, uh, you know, definitions of what they would allow their pathologists, you know, to call endometriosis. So, here's some faults with the literature. The researchers are concentrating on a minority of patients with infertility, possibly identifying less than half of all disease in those patients because they uh, are not recognizing these subtle manifestations. And they're measuring success with a classification system that measures mainly something other than endometriosis, i.e. scar tissue. And the studies frequently have not been biopsy controlled. Most these uh, have a little bit more biopsy control. Now, uh, you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I think that's, that, that's a problem. But that's why we have the confusion that we, that we have. Well, endometriosis in my area, therefore, to, to kind of try to construct a patient profile that you can believe in, is a disease of fertile women of any age suffering from most disease is atypical the black implant is a minority it's static or possibly regressive positionally it's not a progressively spreading disease and most disease is mild are, are, are the higher AFS stages due to something else what use is the distance such it's difficult to say okay let's go on to the next star cell Larger implications, of course, is that there is a large reservoir of undiagnosed disease in America. Current thought does not mirror reality well, and confusion is inevitable. Some cliches. Now, we are all burdened by having to read in the literature. You know, there's overwhelming number of articles. If you keep these cliches in mind, it will allow you to speed read the literature. Because if you see these mentioned anywhere in an article, you can go on to the next next article. <laughs> <laughs> because these, these guys are hanging themselves. Uterus fixed rectum is a common sign of endometriosis. That's extremely <laughs> uncommon. You know, maybe 1%. <laughs> Ovaries most common site. That's obviously incorrect. Identification by typical black powder burn implants. Well, those guys are missing half the disease. Pregnancy prevents or cures. It's a disease of nulligravitas. You know, that's... Th that's opinion, unsubstantiated opinion and now disproven. A progressively spreading recurrent disease, again, unsubstantiated and now disproven opinion. Burned out to the exhausted ends. Uh, who's listening? Only cure is castration or menopause. We have evidence that menopause uh, will take the disease, disease away. Try to tell the 57-year-old lady uh, who was menopausal wife was cleaning endometriosis out. Of the only thing that will cure the disease is problems. The main surgical problem is the attitude of the surgeon. Because if you have the operating room, whether for a laparoscopy or laparos and you think that it's a progressively spreading disease, and you think that you know it's going to come back, and you're tentative, and you you the operating room, knowing what you're doing, be aggressive. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be happy. Surgeons from all over the United States, <laughs> laser surgeons, you know, uh, operative surgeons, laparoscopists, laparoscopists, you know, I clean up after all of them. It's okay. Well, there there are some technical problems that you can get into with surgery. Uh, Addition of disease. You've got to identify the disease. And here's one example of what can happen. Here's a uh, disease in the octopus who is kind of panic flapping down and misses the disease because it's just out of his line of sight. Here's an example of that. Here's, here's the uh, cul de sac, you know, here's your old brubic. Here's the cul de sac. What I'm going to do is a sucker tail radiation and I'm going to pull it this way. Just hiding all the sac out of you. Well, it was a big nother area. Couldn't see it. Now you can. You've got to look everywhere. Peritoneal pox. 16% of patients in this uh, series had peritoneal and 66% had endometriosis. You have to be aware of what peritoneal pockets are and for the water. 
basically defects of formation of the pelvic peritoneum. They occur lateral or just medial of the uterus ligaments. They do not communicate any vital structure such as rectus sigmoid or the ureter. Uh, they will frequently have endometriosis either in the depths of or rim. I think uh, both, both. And you'll see uh, some pocket movals on the video. Which do you do first? Um, I usually just take it. I'm, I, I'm the point. I'll and I just size it, you know, because I can't all tell whether or not something is endometriosis. I mean, you really have to be aggressive with your biopsies. And here's a pocket. Uh, this pocket, you know, kind of like a black hole. It's diving. Down. There's some red lesions, probably endometriosis, uh, around the rim. So that kind of caught my eye pretty readily. But when I ever when I pulled that pocket and inverted it, you know, it was filled with more disease. So you know, you have to be these and look for it. The mouth of the pocket collapses, and if it doesn't have any disease around the rim, it may just be another peritoneal. And so you have to have that manipulating device in the uterus and use it to pull the uterus for, towards the front or side or whichever way you want so that you can put the peritoneum on stretch and help the pocket open. Here's another surgical problem that you can occasionally see. This woman had endometriosis. Characteristic, you know, here's, uh, this is kind of looking at pelvis. Here's her left ovary, left tube. Here's the back of the cervix. Here's the rectus sigmoid down in here. Um, you know, when you open up somebody like this, you kind of you kind of stand back and say, oh my God, you know, can I really remove all of that? And, <clears throat> and I'll show you. Uh, I had a little spawn up there. Okay, I think it's during the lasted about four hours or something, but here is the same era after removal of the peritoneum. Back of the cervix, here's the left over. Uh, she had a little spawn on the Philippian tube there. Okay, I didn't take any pictures during surgery because this surgery lasted about four hours or something, but here is the same area after removal of the peritoneum. There's back of the cervix, here's back of the cervix, there's the left tube. Uh, I'm not sure where the left ovary is now, but it's there. Uh, you know, all this area is denuded and raw. It still looks a lot better than it did before. You can see details of the uh, structures, and yes, you can remove significant disease. Uh, I, I, to the, it's the point now the only disease I can't get out uh, of anybody is when invasive bowel rectum. I'd have to put a surgeon in for me and that kind of stuff. And, but anything else, I think I can get out. I mean, yeah. uh, <coughs> nylon sutures were popular on the ovary. Uh, there. Uh, <coughs> nylon sutures were popular on the ovary. You know, uh, um, there's the as well as the superficial disease. Now, so what does this stuff look like later? Okay, wait. Surgical principles. You've got to remove all affected peritoneum. Not necessarily try to hit little individual lesions, because as I said, it, the peritoneum may also have some structural or functional abnormality that may contribute to pain. Uh, and also, it's more efficient to remove affected areas of peritoneum because a nerve will have lesions on it, just as you saw Dr. Davis do. Uh, you have to have some width to your margins. Get the peritoneum open. You need to do a second look. Well, it's up to you. Peritoneum, is it or not? I'll show you some exam area of the pelvis. That's the back side of the uh, uterus there. There's your left over. Looks cleaner. Looks nice. I'm proud. Okay. This woman had a look laparoscopy about eight, you know, eight weeks. And had this, this about eight, you know, eight weeks later. And she had this, this type of disease all over the pelvis. I mean, it went from her left broad ligament clear across the cul-de-sac to the right. It was all one hemorrhagic mess. And the only thing I found, look how nice the peritoneum had generated. And you'll see other examples of this on the video. The only thing found in her entire pelvis two little flimsy adhesions that were holding the ovary to the rear side of the cervix. You see them a, bit, a little bit better here. Clip, clip, or laser, laser, and the ovary, you know, just, uh, it fell down. It was quite mobile, and uh, she conceived a week after that picture was taken. Here's what happens if you close the peritoneum. This woman had the exact same manifestation and distribution of disease you just saw in a previous patient. The hemorrhage up from right to uh, Removed it, closed, uh, closed her peritoneum. And uh, she came back with her uh, terminal that was causing obstruction, which is why we were on surgery. And as you look down, you see here's the left tube, right tube, sigmoid, scar tissue, the neutral line. When you denude this mum, you're actually putting it together, you're taking the dimension of the rectumoiding and putting it up to <coughs> halfway up the uh, cervix, broad ligaments. So even though you're creating a uh, disappearing uh, surgical result, uh, you're putting a lot of things on stretch that aren't. Okay. And uh, again, I'm just, you know, cervix and. and and to the side wall, here's the round ligament, I guess that probably is, and there's left tube or something. You can put it the, on the right side, the suture is still intact, but on the left, you know, you can see it's been trying to separate, trying to find its way back as the sac was, and, you know, it didn't quite do it, but still, that doesn't look awfully bad, you know, in terms of, uh, she had ovarian involvement also, the same kind of thing. The only difference was I closed the retinium, and the trees were buried in masses of scar, that's why you know, they were buried under there. And I, I showed this, hoping that you'll not tell anybody all this, so I showed her so-called, quote, lysis of adhesions. I mean, it was mess. It was. See, it open, even big areas. Okay. 
What about disease on the small bowel? Well, no, you'll find that occasionally, but unless you're prepared to have your general surgeon friends come in, you know, uh, usually I just say, well, I'll know about it later if uh, she has bowel syndrome, perhaps, and keep my fingers crossed. <coughs> this one had another problem. Here's her small bowel. It's, it's small here, but it's big here. And the reason it's small here and big here is because things are not going through, and so they start to collect here. And this woman had a bowel obstruction. Uh, here's the barium that's trying to get through her terminal ileum. This is the same lady you saw earlier. And uh, it's, just, it's just trying to get its way, its way through, bless its heart, but just not making it. And the reason was was that her terminal started up with endometriosis and you can kind of see how problematic the barium was getting through. For that kind of patient, since we know that medical treatment does not eradicate disease, you have to surgically treat them with your general friend. And she's now asymptomatic. She has no pelvic pain she had, and she no longer has any cheese. Frequently, when you're around this, this, this and biopsying that, you're going to find non-endometriotic mullein tissue. There are other actors in the field besides endometriosis, such as these in the cervicals that harvested from your cervix on the uterus segment, notice it down there in the uh, stroma. So endometriosis is not the only Mullerian uh, tissue that you'll find out there. And of course, Novak, in one of his textbooks from the 1930s or 40s, you know, noted the same thing. Okay, well, let's get down, you know, we kind of you, you know, uh, information. It's probably stuff that you know and um, uh, realize. What about off-the-wall theories, you know? A theory about the disease, if it's going to be... Uh, a vile theory has to explain the following points. It has to explain the static nature of the disease. It has to explain the distribution of the disease. It's most common in the posterior pelvis, but possible occurrence anywhere in the body, as you know, in the lung, diaphragm, enemies uh, like uh, glandular inclusions in the lymph nodes. It's been in the cervix, vulva, GI tract, and it even occur occurs in males, so nobody is safe. It's an associated with other effects that is recognized. Cervicals is most mentioned. Rockensky, Kuster, Hyperdrome. They're patients with or ectopic Mullerian tissue, the cervical or femoral tissue. Some of those mesothelial inclusion cysts or some words that your pathologist may use uh, may just represent uh, undifferentiated endometriosis, just not quite as well differentiated as uh, areas. Again, all of these patients can see without treatment of disease of fertile women, as you, and, uh, you know, even when you remove small amounts of disease, not all people get pregnant. Pregnancy rates range anywhere from like 40 to 75 percent, roughly. And uh, people are trying to claw that upward, but they're just not making it. Uh, it needs to be independent of menstruation because people allege that they, you know, that uh, blood in the peritoneal cavity at the time of the menstrual flow proves retrograde menstruation, all that it doesn't. It just proves that there was blood in the peritoneal cavity. But they say, well, most women have blood in there, so therefore most women are rent, and yet most women don't have endometriosis. So it's got to be independent of menstruation. Uh, there needs, there's, it needs to be the finding of varying and low estrogen progesterone uh, receptors in this tissue for the sake of pardemi, preferably this one theory. And of course, as you'll be aware, the theory that uh, it does is formularios, and it's simply a development of differentiation ration of any cellular, whether it's cervix, endometrium, monotrium, tubal, or even the salomic epithelial onlage of adult peritoneum, because it all comes from the same area. So let's see how this stacks up uh, with the requirements. Well, that's because laid down embryologically. Distribution of disease, most common in the posterior uh, of explanation. Static, well, that's because it's laid down embryologically. The distribution of the disease most common in the posterior pelvis because that's the pathway of organogenesis uh, uh, during embryonic life. It's not because gravity pulls menstrual blood down the lower pelvis, it's because that's the pathway of organogenesis. It just happened to be up there. Possible occurrence anywhere, lung, diaphragm, lymph nodes, males. Well, that just implies possible more derangement of Mullerian migration or differentiation in another. And in terms of the males, you're all aware of the parallel of male and female reproductive tracts of the uh, sickle. Uh, Mullerian dust has been as a um, uh, option. Uh, and it, obviously, in a male, it differentiate. Uh, association with other Mullerian defects, such as cervical stenosis, right? Well, that's because there is an online Whatever it was that made the cervix, whatever uh, problem of formation the embryo that was in that may have been associated with a defect in the laying down of endometriosis, of the endometrium. Uh, association with retinal pocket, well, again, biologic relationship with a salomic epithelium. The pockets form because I'm right. Uh, the perineum didn't form right. The, that online that is from whence the Mullerian ducts are springing to down simultaneously. Other ectopic Mullerian tissue, in this old fimbria, old mesothelial inclusion system, this means all Mullerian structures are at risk for uh, this type of a defect. You know, uh, cause of infertility, the pelvic organs didn't form quite right. Maybe they don't work quite. We still have a good test for tubal fun pregnancy, and maybe the other organs don't, don't work well. It, independent menstruation, it's congenital, birth defect, and uh, low and various estrogen pressures, again, incomplete situation. And this is kind of a schematic of what comes uh, uh, in the uh, big metal cells, future glial cells, and all these other cells that are going to form the, either the endometrium or the human cell, or 
Don't mind me, Jim. Let's begin to close on the genital ridges there. Migration downward. Sorry. Towards the start, they start to line up and form the Mullerian ducts. Uh, however, some of these cells start to lag behind. This could be tubal cells or endometrial cells, what have you. And when differentiation is complete, you know, some of them just didn't make it, and that's why it's a static disease. Mullerian antigen, CA125, which is being touted in the literature as a possible blood test for following endometriosis, this has been found in fetal pleura and fetal pleuric fetal perium. This antigen is basically just, it tells you where did structures that were originally associated with the Mullerian duct system end up and they end up virtually anywhere, which is metriosis anywhere. As I said, uh, tubes may not work. You'll notice frequently with people with metriosis, they'll have excessive fibria near the end of the tube. Uh, the tube didn't form quite right. Hydatids, you know, and, you know, look at the tube when you're doing a laparoscopy. You'll be, you'll be amazed when they hydat it on the end of the tube, they will usually have endometriosis of the right uterocecal ligament. And you can notice that too. Look at the tubes. Uh, if there's a high data, just look down in the pelvis uh, and you'll see this so-called sigil action frequently on the side where the uh, uh, high data is located as formed at the same time. Some of the data even have endometriosis on them. This woman, this poor woman was so mixed up, even had adrenal tissue misplaced. There's a lot of structures in the body that just don't embryologically end up where it's supposed to. Well, what about proof of these various things? You know, nobody's ever going to prove Samson's theory. It'll be with us forever, poisoning the literature and poisoning the mind of young gynecologists. Nobody's ever going to see, nobody's ever going to see a, uh, uh, an endometrial cell flown, uh, a pine cone, and fall in the fertile soil of the pelvis and implant and grow. Nobody will ever see that. But no, nobody has ever seen that I'm aware of. I've never seen anybody show what should be early implant in endometriosis or metaplasia. We know that metaplasia can be seen in the cervix. No one ever come up with anything that they have said, hey, this could be early implantation or early metaplasia, you know. I've never seen it looking at literally thousands and thousands <coughs> of these implants under the microscope, uh, and I'm not aware of it uh, up with any positive proof that they would see implantation. But you think with millions of women going laparoscopy and biopsies, maybe that's the reason why they have biopsy. Sooner or later, somebody would have of that, but so far they haven't. Okay, I want to come all down here from Bend, Oregon and uh, leave you with some, some new information. I figured to myself, well, do we know if this is a congenital disease, birth defect, then you will find young girls, fetuses, infants, what have you. So, through a special job, but for political reasons, the state of the medical examiner, the autopsy or dead and, I don't know, crimes and stuff, bring body parts sent to me in Bend, Oregon. These body parts, I did not pay them. I am clean. Uh, these body parts consisted of the uh, use and rectum, children who died. And I got out eight or nine out before the supply got shot off. I don't know if you read it or not, but it kind of caused a sting. Okay, well, let's look, 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 look at this. This is a flattened gland of endometriosis in an area of endometriosis in a woman who's 23 years of age. Let's compare that to something from the pelvis of a two-month-old baby. Same area. Looks, looks pretty much glandular uh, you know, structure there. Okay, let's get them side by side. Two-month age. 23 age. And 23 age. Not like this. Months of age. You know, I've got, I've got children that are five and I stood in front of the screen and said, Ken Eric, uh, do these things look for them? And I thought, Luke, you know, we saw this. So I, I, I take pretty good confirmation. I think they look alike. I mean, yeah, you think like too. Uh, now, it's okay to think that we have to, you know, think. I can't see I found endometriosis in a two month old because as soon as I did, it would be six experts around the, the world, around the nation, who would have been, this does not satisfy the requirements of 1903 for neonatal images. I can say it might be. Well, in terms of clinical pets, we only did more laparoscopy patients with pain, which details more uh, regard the correct patient profile, or awareness of the atypical implant, and surgical treatment, medical health. For, there needs to be similar, for researchers, there needs to be a similar, better understanding. Of uh, I don't think anybody's going to confirm my findings because, uh, you know, it sound unusual. Uh, the third half of the study, in fact, was just published in Fertility and Virility. You can do better. Investigate. We need to investigate posterior pelvic peritoneum, a premonarchal subject, the time of apnectomies, other laparotomies, autopsies, what have you. And we don't need any new drugs until we get better understanding of the disease. Now, I'd like to close by reading a couple of paragraphs that I got out of uh, Sunday Parade magazine.